Hello, everyone, and welcome to our special draft recap edition of Inside the NFL Front Office. I'm Tom Moore from bikefans.com, and joining me as always is our resident draft expert, Jeff Nichols. i got to ask you, Jeff, it continues to amaze me the amount of attention and audience that a 17 hours uh, of televised show can show you calling names of people for an NFL draft. What is the big draw here? <laughs> hey, I'm sure the tables of television network people ask you the same thing because they're sitting up on a on a podium for 17 hours. But I mean, it's just the natural curiosity everyone has. Everyone sees these uh, outstanding collegiate players uh, every Saturday afternoon um, for one to two years, some uh, leading up to the draft, and they want to know who's my team going to get and where are these big names going to go. Yeah, you know, and we're always undefeated. I got to tell you, I mean, my history of the draft goes back to 1983. I'm in college. I'm I'm basically in between my freshman and sophomore year, and some of my friends were getting drafted out of SMU, so I decided to watch it. And back then, ESPN was putting on because they needed content. So in the middle of the day back then, ESPN would have business news, so they'd read the news. And so they figured, <laughs> here's here's 25, 30 hours, and the draft was, of course, about 15 rounds back then. It gave them something to do. And I'll tell you, I watched it in a community room in a college. You've never seen sorority girls so upset that they couldn't watch their soap operas. Uh, that's hilarious. But, hey, you know, you were just trying to pave your own career path. So, I mean, no one can blame you. There you go. Well, I've turned that, that mantle way over to you. You know the draft better than me, and that's why I want to dive into it. And, you know, as we talked to uh, Rick the other day on Monday about second-round draft choice, uh, Dalvin Cook, uh, he gave us his perspective, but it's always a little bit guarded. So I wanted to ask you, you know, with Cook, did the Vikings make a good move here? A lot of people talked about Joe Mixon, and are you at all concerned about his alleged past uh, off-the-field issues that he's had? No, definitely. I think that's a great place to start with uh, the, the premium draft pick that Vikings were able to uh, pick up early on Friday night last week. Um, but generally, I mean, my thoughts are around the same as I think Spielman stated. I mean, when you have a player of Delvin Cook's talent sitting there at the top of a second round, I mean, it, and you have a need at running back, I mean, there's really no reason to not at least investigate the, the chances of being able to move up for such an immediate impact player. Um, so, I mean, a running back like Delvin Cook proves to be a good value at that point. I mean, off the field issues and, you know, some past injury concerns over his shoulders obviously were brought up throughout the process. But um, just talking to people at FSU and, and seeing certainly some quotes by uh, Jimbo Fisher, the coach down there. I mean, Cook was never a problem in the locker room. He was never a problem on the field. Uh, and generally speaking, the players who have a lot of off-field problems once they get to the NFL are the ones who also struggle kind of in a locker room setting or, you know, get sidetracked while on the field, too. Uh, I mean, Cook generally seemed to have or to understand what his talent could do for him uh, and wanted to improve himself while on the football field at all times. Uh, so, so, I mean, I think he's, he's clearly going to be committed to football once he gets up here to Minnesota. Uh, and it's really going to become a, a non-issue, especially if a strong Minnesota locker room. I keep on hearing people who watched him in college that he, he's a guy who can stick his foot in the ground, go north and south in, in a split second. There's no stop in between. Uh, a pretty unusual thing. What do you see on him in the field? Yeah, no, I mean, that's the next place, place to go with him. Um, I mean, his play speed is outstanding. Uh, I know he didn't test very well at the combine, which kind of shocks some people. Uh, But a player like him, I mean, he might not be the best athlete when you're asking him to compete in the underwear Olympics at the combine. Um, But once you combine his acceleration uh, with his outstanding vision, which is probably his best trait as a runner, uh, I mean, it's something really special. Uh, On the field, Cook really succeeds best in a a zone read offense or kind of where you can spread them out, run them east to west, allow him to kind of see the hole himself and then hit it. Uh, and then something else he, he's proven to be very good at is being able to understand one to cut back. And that's where you see a lot of his big runs in, in college where he's able to, you know, someone loses their blocking assignment, kind of leaves the lane open, and just in a split second he's able to cut back, put his foot in the ground, and next thing you know he's running and off to the races for about 80 yards, and we all know no one's going to catch him. And, and by the way, Jeff, I wanted to ask you on that. You know, last year you know that the, the line was incredibly injury depleted and probably had some talent issues as well. For a guy who's got cutback ability like that, can he make up for some of those blocking deficiencies? Absolutely. I mean, if you look at the line he worked with at Florida State at times, it was definitely below average, even to collegiate standards. Um, and he was able to create on his own. I mean, he's the type of runner whose vision is good enough 
that he understands one what the defense is trying to do him and how they're trying to contain him. Uh, but two, sometimes when you have those offensive lines that are operating generally the way you would expect, um, it can lead to some interesting creases. I mean, if you look back at some of Adrian Peterson's tape when the Vikings offensive line was supposedly top 10 in the NFL, I mean, there are times where there is nothing there and Peterson's able to kind of, you know, fix the mess himself in a sense uh, and, and break off a big run. So, I mean, it's something he's used to working with and hopefully with an improved line, it's a non-issue. I know he's obviously a completely different talent, different style than uh, Latavius Murray. Is there any chance the Vikings think of a split backfield with those two guys? We don't see that very much in the NFL. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the running back by committee approach has been something that's been, you know, becoming more common in the past couple of years. Uh, But they're definitely not going to give Cook the full workload on day one. I mean, the number one flaw, really, besides off-the-field issues for Cook or potential injury concerns, is, is his ball security. And, I mean, until it's proven to be a problem in the NFL, he's going to get the benefit of the doubt, of the doubt obviously. Um, and no one should harp on him until it becomes a problem. Uh, but, but Murray's going to be your power back. I mean, the way I look at it is Delvin most likely will develop into your first and second down kind of workhorse. Uh, but then Murray will be able to step in in red zone situation, short yardage situation. Uh, and, and really take over Asiata's role, but in a much expand in a much more expanded way. Uh, he won't be limited to just a few snaps Asiata got, but he, he's that guy can that can really punish a defense uh, before Cook can kind of come in and give them a, a change of pace and and really make them try to catch him on them catch him on their heels. You talk about a propensity to fumble. I got to be honest with you. How do you think you'd do if I gave you the football and some uh, Linval Joseph at you? I'd fumble too. Well, I'd throw him the ball and run. <laughs> <laughs> I would die for the ground. Hopefully, uh, I don't know if I'd get up, but hopefully I wouldn't fumble either. You and I have talked about this before. For fans who just don't know the college game as well, is there anybody uh, with the Cooks skill set that's either in the NFL right now or somebody that you know of that kind of re- you can relate to the fans? Yeah, no. I think the comp for Delvin Cook I've always kind of thought of is Jamal Charles. Um, you know, when Jamal Charles was at Texas, he, didn't look, he, he was able to be an explosive back out of the backfield. He can make some plays in the receiving game, uh, but it was kind of the same thing. No, no one really thought of him as highly coming out of college as you know some of the scouts did. And once he got into the NFL and was able to uh, be expanded uh, and be put in almost a better formation with the Chiefs, he was able to really explode onto the scene. You said it before. Even though he could fix up some of the mess of an offensive line, he needs an offensive line. And, and even with the Vikings signing a couple of veteran offensive tackles in free agency, the depth and even the starters at guard and center, it really is painfully thin prior to this draft. So I was actually pretty excited to see the Vikings go after Pat uh, Elfline from Ohio State. And I'm wondering from your perspective, uh, how much of his wrestling background will help with him on leverage? And I asked that question because my brothers used to wrestle. They throw me to the ground, so I know leverage matters, not so much size. And then will he give the Vikings a bit of a nasty streak on the line? Yeah, I think wrestling backgrounds for both offensive and defensive linemen is something, I mean, a trait coaches really look for. Like you said, uh, the leverage game is so important. And I mean, the one thing that I've heard other scouts talk about is with wrestlers, they're best when they're almost out of position. I mean, a lot of offensive linemen who don't have that physicality or that knack to being physical, um, once they're off balance, they're done. Whereas a wrestler, I mean, that's just when you're getting started, uh, when, you, when you're on the mat. So that, it really brings out a lot of compete as well, I, I think, in some players. So, I mean, I was very excited to see Pat Elfline on the board. I mean, who would have guessed the Vikings would trade up twice um, for their first two draft picks? But he's definitely the type of player who's nasty, physical, uh, and, and is best pulling and getting out in space and getting some momentum behind him. I think he'll remain at center in the NFL, or is that at least where he'll get his first opportunity to perform? Um, but he should be able to make an impact this upcoming season. Yeah, and it, it, would he, do you see him as impact, or does, because he's played at a big program like Ohio State, could he step in? Because we're all worried about Joe Berger, a Berger of you know how long does he have at 34 years of age of effectiveness as a starter? Could he step in? I think Elfline can definitely step in as a center from day one. He has plenty of time on the field with Ohio State. Um, so it's not like you're trying to groom someone to become an eventual starter, um, but he's someone that I think the Vikings have the expectation he can he can really come in and make an impact day one um, and really push Berger into that right guard spot possibly. 
Yeah, and that's interesting as well. I mean, if, if he can push, terrific. But you don't see him as the swing-type lineman of, hey, he's a backup for all three positions, other than he might do it as rookie year while he learns. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's probably the backup plan. But the one thing I will say is uh, once Ohio State moved him to the center position, he really began to excel. Uh, so I think his best bet in the NFL is to keep him and develop him as a center of the future. Gotcha. You know, an interesting side note on him is I looked these guys up. We, we made requests to interview all these 11 draft choices, and you find them on Twitter, and they have two, 3,000 followers, maybe less than that. Elfine and Cook are like superstars. I get it with Cook, the sexiest position of a running back, but Elfline's got 35,000 Twitter followers. He's like a rock star. Yeah, I mean, big program helps, but, I mean, he was definitely a leader on that team as well. So I think if you ask people or in Ohio or that are big Ohio State fans, everyone would know who Zach or Pat Elfline is, which is kind of funny because he's your center. Yeah, well, you know, I like the pick of Miami's Danny Isadora in the fifth round. But, you know, when you look at him on film and you kind of read about him, there seems to be some concerns about his ability to hold up in the interior of the line against those big nose tackle types. What do you see in him and what do you like or dislike about Danny? Uh, I would agree, but I think he was a good value to get later on in the draft. Um, he's someone that's obviously hasn't perfected his craft, uh, at least to be able to step in at the NFL level probably immediately. But he definitely has a lot of a trait you look for to develop. Uh, I think the big thing or the theme you're starting to pick out here is that with Cook, he plays best, or best in a, a stretch zone blocking scheme. Elfline's best when he's being pulled. And really, uh, Isi Adora is the same way. Being able to get out in space is where he's most successful. Um, he's the kind of guy who's quick enough. He'll beat you to your spot, and he'll be able to sit his, hit it or uh, set his block. But like you said, where he really struggles is holding up against the big bull rushers and being able to consistently place his hands and gain the leverage he needs to hold up in pass protection. Um, those are the things that obviously a year of uh, NFL level coaching will likely help if he's able to make the roster, which is, I mean, for a later round draft pick with this type of in, in our roster. I guess is probably likely with the interior depth they have, but he's definitely a season away, but it'll be interesting to see how he progresses because if he can develop a better anchor, he definitely could become a starting caliber guard in the NFL. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting. You talk about the zone blocking schemes or what have you. Yeah, can you help the fans with what Minnesota was running last year? And did they, they just didn't seem as athletic. So in other words, you know, when they think back to the team in 98, which everybody looks at, you had a Matt Burke at center with a pretty big guy. He could get out and run the, the, the trap plays and the sweeps, you know, and get out front on the draw plays as well. Um, is that what we're talking about with this, with this scheme? And why couldn't they do it last year? Yeah, I mean, as we look back at last season, I think a big issue that started to play out as the season progressed was just the chemistry of the line. I mean, when you're interchanging parts every single week and you're having even players play different positions, look at Verger last year, he started as center, but then eventually he got pushed to guard because they figured out that, hey, we'll start Easton instead because our interior depth is slacking so much. Um, and you can't just pull offensive linemen off the streets and accept, expect them um, to be able to step in and really understand the entire system from day one, which, you know, forced them into more of a man-to-man blocking scheme. At some point last season, you almost have to believe the Vikings said, well, hey, just push your guys back. I mean, it's as simple as that. Um, instead of worrying about what the system would dictate or what they had hoped to do early in the preseason. Moving forward, now that they're going to be transitioning more to a West Coast offense with Pat Shermer, they're going to want to be a lot quicker along the line. Uh, obviously, they're still going to want to be physical and be able to punish the men and you know wear out the defense. But they're, you're going to see a lot of more sweeps, a lot more pulling guard, centers trying to get to the second level uh, to really open up fumes in the run game for Cook to be able to take the ball to the outside, but also to open up those cutback lanes. Um, to allow him to put his foot in the ground and really break off some big chunks of yardage. You know, I think that gives them the, the hope on the offense, and that, I think that's the key. If we can solidify that line, we can work with the receivers that we've got. We, we bring that running game along, and at least we get that, some of that balance we were looking for. But when you look at the other side of the ball, the, the defense didn't really have a lot of holes. I mean, the injuries ultimately got almost every position on the team. Uh, but with that first of our fourth-round picks, we got defensive tackle Jaleel Johnson uh, out of Iowa, and he, he's not the big gobble-up, you know, space eater uh, or, or run stuffer, uh, but we have that in, Le- in Linval Joseph. Uh, what are his best attributes? And most most important, I think, for fans, does he have any of that natural speed that Sharif Floyd had to get a strong pass rush up the middle? 
Yeah, opening up the third day of the draft, I mean, I think Jaleel Johnson will end up being a very solid choice for the Vikings. I mean, talk about another guy with a wrestling background who understands how to play the leverage game. Um, Johnson really has is an active motor. Uh, he's one of those high-effort guys who also has the speed and the power combination um, to, to be able to get in the backfield and you know stuff their run game, but also get after the quarterback at times. Um, looking back at his career at Iowa, I mean, the big thing that really stood out to me is the way he progressed as a player. Um, he didn't step in on day one and wasn't the most productive interior lineman for them. Um, but as he developed uh, at Iowa, he was always on the upward swing, which is what you look for players to show that, hey, he definitely hasn't reached his ceiling yet. Um, the, the big thing that Johnson does well, and this is something that's important in all linemen, is he's able to transition from speed to power. Um, which is big because it keeps the interior alignment off guard because you don't know if he's going to try to hit you with a quick step or if he's going to try to bull rush you. Uh, so being able to see that uh, definitely makes you feel positive about his you know, ability to stick in the NFL. Uh, but he's able to close in in the backfield as well. He's able to complete and wrap up players. And, and there's a time he's a very smart player too. You see it, uh, I think it was on the Michigan tape. Uh, at times he, he steps in the, to rush the passer, realizes, hey, it's a run play and then jumps to the hole next to him and stops to run. So I think if you look at him, he's, he's kind of a multi-functional defensive tackle. He's able to step in at that three technique and push the pocket backwards, but he also could rotate in at nose tackle at times and kind of be an undersized nose uh, because he has a knack for the running lanes and is able to stuff to run as well. Um, if he doesn't have that first step quickness Floyd has, to get back to your other question, uh, but but he also has a little bit more power as well. So it's kind of a trade-off between the two. Well, the thing you said there that makes me realize why Zimmer probably likes him is Zimmer likes that, that flexibility on the line. That's why you'll see a Brian Robinson shift inside so they can get that kind of pinch on a, on a guard uh, center situation to get back there. It sounds like that's what you think Jaleel Johnson may have. Yeah, no, and I mean for someone like Johnson, or Jaleel Johnson, I guess should be a time Johnson too, uh, yeah. it should allow him to get on the field earlier too. I mean, anytime you can get a rotational piece or someone who can play multiple positions, it just, you know, expedites the time it takes for you to get on the field and prove yourself. Well, you know, the, the other fourth rounder is a guy I liked, but remember, you're the talent here. I have no idea what's really good on the field. They all look good to me. Uh, but Ben Gideon of, of Michigan, I keep reading that they think he doesn't have the speed needed to be a starter. And if that's true, and it may not be, and you can dispute it, but if it's true, why pick him in the fourth round for depth? Or do I have my facts all wrong here, Jeff? Uh, no, you don't have your facts all wrong. I mean, I think a lot of people were surprised by the pick and kind of, you know, questioned why we would go with an inside linebacker so early. And, I mean, I think that's a valid – I guess I shouldn't say it's a valid discussion to be had, uh, but I think it just caught people off guard, which always kind of brings up a natural curiosity in everyone. Um, the thing Gideon does the best is he has great instincts. He's able to see the ball and is able to get to his spot in order to make a play with it. Uh, which, I mean, you see that in a lot more old-school linebackers than you do in the new-age athletic freak shows that run a, run the linebacker position at the NFL level. Um, but you can never get away with someone who has good instincts. I know at Michigan, he didn't always put on you know the show. He wasn't the star player on the defensive side of the ball, but he just simply did his job. Um, and, I mean, once Audi Cole left the Vikings this soft season, I mean, they definitely need to be able to fill in a hole behind uh, – Kendricks at the inside linebacker position, but everyone underestimates the amount that Cole did on special teams as well. And if you look at what Gideon was able to do on special teams at Michigan, he was basically an all-star um, in, in that phase of play. So being able to grab him um, to grab a depth piece, but also kind of grab a multifunctional superstar on special teams. I mean, there's tremendous value to be had there, both in his ability to stick on an NFL roster, uh, but also for his ability to get on the field immediately. You know, if you throw uh, Gideon in the mix with uh, Emmanuel Lamer, you know, obviously a big time player in Canada didn't show as much other than special teams with us because he was a backup. And then you got Kentrell Brothers and Edmund Robinson. Which one of those guys would you expect to elevate and be the person who takes over for Chad Greenway? I think the incumbent right now is probably Emmanuel Lamer. Um, but, you know, the funny thing is, even though he's a seventh round pick, I really do think Elijah Lee has a spot on this roster. Um, I think he has a lot of the traits the Vikings look for in their linebackers uh, and is someone that possibly could challenge him just due to his ability to be a little more multifunctional than Lemur and maybe play coverage a little better or at least be upsides there for him too. 
Yeah, and it was interesting because, you know, it's a little biased here, but Ben Lieber, of course, loved that because he's out of Kansas State as well. But, you know, 228 is pretty small for a linebacker at this point in time. He has, does he have room to bulk up, or what are they looking for him? Maybe to utilize his speed? Yeah, I mean, I think the speed is his biggest factor. And I think he's a multifunctional linebacker as well. I mean, he's not a pass rusher. He's not going to be – he's not in the mold of Anthony Barr by any means. Um, but he's able to work through traffic extremely well, has a good set of instincts. But like you said, he's a little small. Um, and the reason the, – the way I got comfortable over it is just by the fact that he's he's a tackling machine um, for, for Kansas State last year. He's not afraid to play physical football, uh, which is something that some of the smaller linebackers kind of shy away from. Um, so, I mean, I'm not so worried about him being small. It's just a matter of how well he'll hold up in the NFL game, being the size he is, wanting to, you know, run downhill and really lay into people. I remember what they said about Eric Kendricks. They said he was smallish too, but he certainly didn't have any problems sticking his head in there and making tackles. Oh, absolutely not. He's a yeah. gem to watch. Well, you know what? We're always on the lookout for wide receivers. <laughs> Got a couple of them. Uh, the first one's out of Central Florida. That's Rodney Adams. And you talk about smallish. He, he's tiny. And he's kind of a slot receiver. And, and I, I'm interested because I know you've gone on record saying you know, some of the problems with Laquan Treadwell was injuries, which would be great to get somebody a little bit taller, a little bit more physical out there. But it looks like Adams is more in the mold of the Thielen Diggs right uh, area. Is he purely a special teamer and kickoff returner candidate, or do you really see him making a difference in the receiving game? I think from day one he'll generally be looked at as a, as a special teamer and kind of a gadget player almost. Um, someone who can take speed sweeps and, you know, get that one-two quick step acceleration uh, to make something happen with the ball in his hands. I, I think he has to come a little ways as a wide receiver. Uh, I mean, if you look at his tape uh, of when he played in college, he does a lot at the line of scrimmage, a lot of screens, a, a lot of the speed sweeps, like I kind of spoke about just a second ago. Um, and he made a few plays down the field, but that really wasn't his bread and butter. Uh, I mean, he was kind of a boomer bust player uh, on the field. I think in his 90 touches that he got last season, he scored on 10 of them, uh, which is crazy to think about if you hmm. kind of put that in perspective. But he also fumbled nine times as well. Um, so I think ball security is the number one thing he's going to have to focus on. Even as a special teamer, if you put him back there in the kick return game, uh, I mean, you obviously have to be able to secure the ball. or You're going to be giving it up in uh, opponent territory most likely. Um, so I think that's kind of where he starts out of as a player. Someone that I know some on draft day, a lot of people were like, well, hey, like we needed another wide receiver, but this isn't the guy I would have thought of. The guy I generally kind of push him towards is a guy you may know well um, on the Dallas Cowboys, but Lucky Whitehead. Uh, he's oh, yeah. not the greatest wide receiver in the world, but he's someone who really sticks on rosters because you can do some things with him on offense, uh, but he's an elite special teamer in the return game. Do you see him kickoff and punt return, maybe push Marcus Sherrills, or just kickoff returner? Probably kickoff returner. I don't want to put myself in too deep because Marcus is such a good punt returner, um, right. just in his ability to secure the ball and make things happen uh, uh, once getting the ball in his hands. But I could definitely see him being the opening day kick returner as he can prove to hold on to the ball. Okay, well, you know, you know, you you. you position him with a seventh round pick uh, in Stacy Coley he's been one of those ones that I see on tape and I talked to Chuck Foreman about it and of course he loves him but he's up and down so in other words you know he'll do well for a while then he'll disappear uh, what's he got to do to step up to make this roster I think you just really spoke to it yourself he needs to be consistent uh, I think if you look back at what he did at Miami in year one he kind of lost on to the scene and everyone's like well who's the Stacy Coley guy uh, he looks to be one of the better next Miami receivers, uh, being second fiddle to uh, Philip Dorsett uh, from the Colts. But uh, I think consistency is one, and just proving to be committed to football. I know some, I mean, obviously, obviously I haven't talked to him personally, but some have questioned his love for the game. Um, and that's something that with someone as talented as he is, uh, just from a raw football standpoint, if you're not committed, that's pretty much for writing on the wall uh, for any player. So I think he needs to come into camp and be willing to work. And if he's able to, you know, put on a show during camp, he should at least initially make an NFL roster. Uh, but if not, maybe he's a practice squad candidate. But otherwise, if he's not committed and kind of starts out on a lull, he, he might not last as long as many think he's capable of in the NFL. Let me put you in the GM and scouting department right now. And 
how do you tell that? A fan always hears, well, he's not committed. He doesn't have the passion for football. Do you see it on tape? How do you know that? Um, uh, well, for me, it's more secondhand remarks of what other people have made. Um, but for him, the tape kind of follows, or it makes a little bit of sense. Uh, when he started playing at Miami, everyone expected him to you know, ascend the ranks and become the clear number one receiver there. And once that didn't start happening and he kind of, you know, fizzled out slightly going into his second and third years, it, it makes you think of what else is going on behind the scenes here. Why didn't he progress? Uh, and then once you hear secondhand remarks of, well, maybe he's not as committed to the game as some other players. Maybe he just truly doesn't love football. Um, that, that's when you start maybe listening to the secondhand or offhand remarks others are making a little more. Um, so I guess it kind of depends on the player as an, from an outsider's perspective, but teams are able to go in and interview coaches, uh, interview the player himself, and really get a better gauge for things themselves. Uh, along if they're very serious about players, they can do some uh, different psychology evaluations as well to really kind of hone in on what type of player they are. Gotcha. Well, you know what? I'm always excited when we get a guy drafted named Bucky. And obviously, in the sixth round, we picked up Bucky Hodges, the tight end from Virginia Tech. Now, when I see this guy, he's made some big plays, but I also see a pretty inconsistent route runner, and, and he kind of has lapses where he drops the pass. Uh, but yet he seemed really irritated to go in the sixth round, so he thinks highly of himself. I kind of like somebody who's motivated. Who is this guy, Jeff, and, and what will his role be? He seems more of a pass-catching tight end to me, which would indicate to me that David Morgan's going to be more of that blocker and H-back uh, to replace Red Ellison. Who is this guy, Bucky Hodges? Bucky Hodges. I can't disagree. If you having a guy named Bucky, he's never a bad pick. So it's a, a fun name. I mean, I'm sure the announcers going into the week, if he can become a – get on the field at some point, we'll be excited to call his name as well. Um, but Bucky Hodges, like you said, is really an inconsistent player uh, when you watch the tape. I mean, going into the draft or pre-draft, I watched some tape on tight ends, knowing that, hey, the Vikings most likely would be looking at some. Um, and Bucky was someone a lot of the media and fans were excited about but someone I wasn't as hot on. I mean, I wouldn't say I, in the pool that was, would disagree with drafting him, uh, given that they were able to get him later on. But I wasn't jumping uh, either. So I guess as a player, like you said, down the field, he's able, he's more physical and he's faster and he has all the physical attributes you look for. He has the speed, he has the explosiveness, but you just don't always see that on tape. Um, so kind of the opposite of Delvin Cook, you know, you can win the underwear Olympics at the combine, uh, but then you need to be able to match that speed on tape as well, which, which isn't always there. Uh, he's kind of the tight end weapon that you can move around the field. You can line him up at wide receiver. You can line him up in the slot. You, you can try to, I guess, dictate his matchups on the field, which is, I mean, a, a big plus for him. But the skill he lacks is inline blocking, which is completely fine because the, uh, the, the moving tight end has become more of a, a thing in the NFL these days. But it's a place where he's going to really have to prove his roster spot because, like you said, you have Kyle Rudolph who can be more of an inline blocker and work the inside of the field. But then you also have David Morgan who can do a little bit of everything as well. Uh, so Hodges is going to have to prove his worth on the roster moving forward. But and the main way you can do that is become a hands catcher. One, don't double catch the ball. Don't try to catch it with your hands. Um, and two, gain separation down the field consistently. Well, I would tell you this. When you and I get to camp this year in summer, we're grabbing Bucky pretty early, not only for the name, but I hear this guy's a character. This ought to be fun to talk to him. Yeah, no, if you just listen to some of his quotes after the draft, I mean, he was, uh, I think, probably one of the media's favorites to interview. No, but so, well, here's the big test for you, Jeff. What in the world? Is an Ifiati Odenigbo, the seventh rounder from Northwestern. Defensive end here, what do we have? A pure pass rusher is what he is. Uh, I mean, he's a tough player. Uh, obviously, he's not, a, not scared to rush the passer and, and take the contact in order to get there. Um, but that's really all he is. He's kind of a one-trick pony in a sense in that he wasn't asked to play run contain all that much. He, he was put onto the field solely to get to the quarterback, and he did it quite well at Northwestern. Uh, I think finishing maybe second or third all time on their sacks list. Um, so moving forward, I mean, you have to look at him as being camp depth uh, in competition with Stephen Weatherly to see who's going to be the pass rusher that the Vikings are going to try to develop. Uh, so that's something we'll have to watch going into training camp. But I think he's an immediate candidate for the practice squad as well. 
he has the uh, instincts to get to the passer, but it's just a matter of making him a much more rounded player. I, I don't want to overplay this because a guy who came out was raw. We got a lot earlier in the draft a couple of years ago was Daniil Hunter. I'm not saying he's a Hunter type, but when you say he's a pure pass rusher, that's what was said about Daniil Hunter. Any of those same skill set, skill sets here, or are my expectations a little high on this guy? I would say your expectations are probably a little high, just because um, Daniil was such an athletic freak uh, as well. Uh, Daniil just needed to be in the NFL game. His game is much more suited for an NFL style defense um and i mean just once he learned how to play with leverage at the nfl level it kind of that was the big key to unlock his potential uh, i think with uh, i mean uh, you're shooting you're in you're shooting high but you never want to uh save a vikings defensive coaching staff isn't able to get lightning in a bottle twice either yeah well nobody be upset about that remember everson griffin was that guy a few years ago they couldn't figure out where to play him yeah so you, you never know. At least we, we'll keep the hope up. Remember, it's like the draft. We're all undefeated right now. We can feel good about it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Until you see him on the field, every team was the winner this past weekend. Except maybe the Bears. Except <laughs> they keep taking the quarterbacks. I would agree with that. Well, I hear our final seventh-round choice in Jack uh, Tocho is a good press corner, uh, which Mike Zimmer's got to like in his defensive scheme. But I also understand his speed is a little bit limited if a receiver is stretching the field on him deep. Uh, is his role more of a nickel or dime corner, taking the underneath routes? To be completely honest, I think the Vikings might try him out at safety, um, which is something that I don't think has been brought up too often with Tocho. But he has the skills or the intelligence. He sees the ball well in the air. He's able to make plays on it. Um, he has decent instincts, and he's an overall smart player. Like you said, the hips are a little stiff, and the speed is sometimes lacking. Um, but when you look at him as a player, he really has a nice, um, uh, a nice skill set for safety, uh, especially kind of in the box, kind of behind Sandejo. I could definitely see the Vikings kind of trying to use him in that position. Is he a little tiny at 200 pounds for safety, or, or do you expect him to bulk up maybe? He's a little tiny. could probably add a little more weight, but if you watch him on tape, or once I did after the draft, he's not someone I really focused on pre-draft. Uh, he plays a lot bigger than his size, uh, which I think kind of speaks volumes. As you look at the draft as a whole, okay, obviously we got a first rounder with a second round choice as far as talent, uh, and we close out for this evening. Uh, do you feel like the Vikings did a good job of filling the holes they had, and is this roster strong enough now, assuming injuries don't happen, to truly compete for the NFC North title? I do think they can compete for the NFC North title. I mean, what really matters is how quickly Elfline can kind of get in here. If he can start from day one, great. If not, I think the answer is, who's your solution, Ben, at right guard, whether it's Cyril's, whether it's Berger, if Easton playing center? I think that's the question that would have to be answered. On the defensive side of the ball, the real hole that's left is, I mean, they showed a lot of confidence in Mackenzie Alexander by not drafting another nickel cornerback to the roster. Um, can he hold up in that spot? Will Terrence Newman have to rotate into the slot, um, which is another option if that's not working out how the Vikings planned. And then I guess the indirect relationship there is, hey, can Trey Wayne play more snaps on the outside this season? So, I mean, I think all the pieces are there for the Vikings. I mean, guarding against injuries, which are inevitable in the NFL, um, are capable of you know competing this upcoming season. Um, but I mean, like any roster, once you fill a hole, there's a new one that's open because everyone's always looking for the weakest link. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, uh, you know, when you talk about Terrence Newman, I mean, we really do need, uh, some of the corners to step up the young ones like, like Alexander, because, and this is no joke, uh, Newman's closer to social security than his high school graduation. That's a scary thought. It's a scary thought. I mean, he has an amazing season last, last year. Um, and I mean, you hate to doubt the guy. I mean, you have to assume he's going to be able to keep it up, but. At some time, the wall hits you. I mean, regardless of who you are, we've seen it time and time again in the NFL. Um, so you always kind of have to uh, cover all your bases, I guess, as an NFL front office. Yeah, my wall hit me at 22 years of age. <laughs> 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 well, listen, for all of our listeners, this is a great time after draft to really, when you don't know the players as well, Jeff can provide the insights that he didn't even cover here. So feel free once you listen to this uh, broadcast, Ask Jeff any questions you have. He'll reply to you within the post. And don't forget to follow Jeff on Twitter at vikefans.com. So until next time, for Jeff Nichols, I'm Tom Moore. So long, everyone.